Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Don't you like? Uh, didn't you like this last song we sang? I, I think it's really beautiful. You know, but, but they're gonna have to sing it next week as well, because next week is uh, Yom Teruah, that is the, the feast of uh, trumpet, actually known in rabbinical Judaism as Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah means the first of the year, but uh, the first of the year really in the scriptures is in uh, Nisan, that is uh, March, April. But next we will celebrate the uh, feast of trumpets. Also, our hearts and prayers are with all those who are suffering and those who lost so much. You know, I'm thinking of the massive uh, earthquake, 8.1, actually, earthquake, which hits hits, uh, Mexico, right? The quake was so powerful, actually, it it was felt even a thousand kilometers away from, from the center. Uh, also, the U.S. issued a tsunami warning for uh, you know, Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico, El Salvador, and Costa Rica. And uh, how about these two uh, hurricanes? You know, Irma and Jose. You know, there's, there's a massive, actually, uh, you know, people are getting out of uh, right now. Uh, Florida, Florida, right? I know. So, I mean, it's this one after the other one. And also, uh, we hear of these uh, people, you know, the Muslim, the Rohingya. Muslims, you know, who, of whom many died. They are uh, talking about 125,000 refugees who fled Bangladesh. Okay, well, what's happening? So many things are happening at the same time. And North Korea, you know, last Sunday they tested a bomb. A bomb. You know, the weapon was the most powerful this country had tested to date by putting the explosive yield of 50 to 100 kilotons. Now, to put it in context, the nuclear bomb dropped on Hiroshima in 1945, which instantly killed 80,000 people, had a yield of 15 kilotons. So we're talking here about a massive nuclear bomb, a massive one. What's happening to our world? These, I believe, are, are, are signs, wake-up signs to remind us that this is not heaven. Okay? This is not the millennium. This is not how God intended this earth to be. These things, hurricanes, earthquakes, floods, and rumors of wars, serious wars, bid us to, to look up to our Creator. And for us who believe, all, all these represent opportunities. A, a Kairos, remember Kairos? To, to, to speak of God and the plan of salvation, and also to speak of prophecies, prophecies, for the scriptures tell us what will happen in the future. And we can already see the world is preparing for the final moment. And so the... Everything is open for us right now. The the, the fields are ripe. We should go and preach the word. And there couldn't have been a better moment in history than today than to open up, I believe, the book of Daniel. For the Spirit has so much to say in this book about the end times. You can open up your scriptures to the book of Daniel with me. The book of Daniel contains in itself the, the full message of prophecy predictive and practical. He tells us with so many details what will happen and how this knowledge affects and and shapes and blesses actually our lives. Daniel speaks of both, the first and second coming of the Messiah and how these two major events in history influence the nations of the world, all of them, and Israel also which is in the center. And today Daniel's prophecies of the end times are becoming increasingly comprehensible, right? Graspable At the end of the book, the angel Gabriel, who who brought these revelations to the prophet, tells him, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end times. Today the seal is slowly breaking up and the book is opening. We have never been closer to the realization of these end time predictions. Because now we can already see all these nations of the world who will play a role at the very end, ready to strike. Some even cannot wait as they have begun to threaten each other with nuclear strikes. The king of the north, spoken by Ezekiel, Russia, which its allies, which is allies and whom, of whom we run, and Turkey. Their armies are today right where they're supposed to be for the end times. Both Russia and Iran are the borders of Israel. The king of the east, spoken by John, the Asian countries, North Korea, Japan, China, and their neighbors. There we read on the daily basis of wars and rumors of wars. The king of the south, spoken by Daniel, Egypt, with its neighbors, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, and others. There's so much unrest in these areas. And then... 
the other mysterious kingdom, which Daniel especially and John saw but could not comprehend, which appears like a terrible beast, one which is ruled by the, uh, the prophet, what the prophet calls the willful king, whom he says will exalt and magnify himself above every god. That would be the last evil kingdom before the second coming of Yeshua, rising, I believe, from Europe and even from our continent. And Israel, the focal point of the end times, where at the very end, all the nation will take such a great uh, and incomprehensible interest upon this tiny country. These main actors of the end times are ready. The seal is almost gone and Daniel has so much to tell us about today. And this book is a major focal point of prophecies of the scriptures. As it carries elements which fills and illuminates Revelation, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Joel, and others. Yeshua himself asks us to keep this book close to us as time rolls away. He said in Matthew 24, 15, Therefore when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet... When you see the abomination of desolation, that is the time when the Antichrist will enter the temple and proclaim himself God. But we already see these events leading to it. We already see that the temple in Israel is not far from being built. It is almost there for they have everything except the building. We already see that the world is begging for such a leader as the Antichrist. Antichrist, as John calls them. We already see so many things leading to the abomination of desolation. Daniel is a book for today. And you know what? Without considering any of these things, we already know that Daniel must be a powerful book when you consider the force with which some are trying to undermine it. And this for the last 2,000 years. But it is still here with us today. For instance, you know, his prophecies surrounding the first coming of Jesus are said to have been written after the facts because they are so true, so precise. But this is what the majority of commentators today say about this book. They see Daniel as a historian, as a scribe, not a prophet. Because they don't believe in the power of the divine prophecies. They cannot conceive that its words are fully inspired by the Spirit of God. And for the prophecy of the first coming of the Messiah, these are so clear and convincing that some have taken the same road, they also deny Daniel as a prophet. Some writers in the Talmud and even in the Zohar have declared that Daniel is not a prophet. Why is that? But what do you think they go there? Today does not appear within the prophetic books of their arrangements of the scriptures. He has been put with the writings, that is the Psalms and Proverbs, and removed from the prophetic books. Why? You know, I think I understand. I understand, for if one proclaims Daniel as a prophet, this will amount to declaring Jesus as the Messiah. For Daniel gives us the exact time when Jesus appeared on earth. And twice he tells us that he first dies, and then he resurrects, and he establishes his kingdom on earth. I can understand. The best way to fight the clarity and plainness of these prophecies is simply to deny Daniel completely, because there's no argument. Yes, this is what they did after that Jesus came to earth. For before this, the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Bible done by 70 rabbis, 300 years before the Messiah, clearly called the man Daniel the prophet, and left him in the prophetic section. Furthermore, the Qumran, as well, speak of Daniel the prophet, and even Josephus, the secular Jewish historian. He himself, by the way, was amazed at the prophecies contained in this book, and spoke of Daniel the prophet. And surprisingly so, even Maimonides, a founder of today's rabbinical Judaism from the 12th century, calls him Daniel the prophet. But... The one who has the ultimate authority, Jesus himself, spoke of Daniel the prophet. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken by whom? Daniel the prophet. Yes, he is a prophet and today it is time that we raise this book high up and deliver it from the deniers then. For it contains great prophecies for today. 
And besides these end time prophecies, this book may be one of the most practical in the scriptures. We're going to see how a knowledge of God and of his word can establish and affirm an individual. When the Babylonians came and destroyed the temple in Jerusalem and then carried so many Israelites away, where there seems to have been no hope for the nation of Israel, Daniel stands He stands as a calm and composed individual, a man of prayer and of great faith. One who knew God so well from his word. Even his captors, by the way, we're going to see, were in admiration towards them. How did he do it? How did he not get affected by the chaos around him? Again, it's his knowledge of the word of God. And this morning I pray, I pray that the Lord will bless us all with his inspired word and establish us just like he established Daniel. Let's go to the text now and let's just read the first two verses. The first two verses open up the historical context of the book. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim brings us to 605 before the coming of Christ. And there was a powerful, powerful Babylonian empire who came against Jerusalem. This was the first of three invasions. But the question is, what attracted such a powerful empire to this small city of Jerusalem which had no strategical value at all? There are two reasons for this. The first one is gold. Gold. You know, this is the the first time that Jerusalem was to be ransacked after the mighty kingdom of Solomon. And there was still in the temple so much gold, and they knew it. We learn from the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 3, that just the Holy of Holies, the inner chamber of the temple where the Ark of the Covenant was, contained 600 talents of gold. A talent is about 30 grams, 30 kilograms that is, which gives us about 18,000 kilograms of gold, which amounts to about a billion dollars that took this market value. In addition of this, we read that the lamps of the holy place, which were made of pure gold, and of the altar of incense, which is called the altar of gold, was made completely of gold, and those hands with bowls of gold, and so much more. It was an easy prey for Nebuchadnezzar. He must have known about it, because about a hundred years before, a king, Hezekiah, once got so sick, he almost died. And after he recovered from his sickness, the Babylonians sent him gifts, and he was so touched that he Show them all the riches of Jerusalem. They never forgot them. For we know that Babylonians were great historians and recorded everything of value. And here they are, now ready to take them. And we hear that the invasion was so devastating that they burnt, actually, the house of God. And broke down the walls of Jerusalem and burnt all its fortified buildings with fire and destroyed all its valuable articles. Why did they use so much fire? They burnt everything surely to get all the gold out, for many of the articles in the temple were made of wood covered with gold, like the poles and so many doors. By burning everything, they extracted all the gold that they could. But I want to tell you something, the gold, the riches, were only a bait. For behind this invasion lies one of the greatest spiritual battles. That is the second reason unknown to Nebuchadnezzar. Notice the words which are used in these two verses. Let's begin with verse 2. Where we learn that all these riches were brought to the land of Shinar. Shinar. You know, a word used only eight times and always associated with rebellion against God. Its first appearance is in connection with Babel. For this is where the Tower of Babel was built. The Tower of Babel stands as the ultimate opposition to God's authority when the nations of the world raise their fists against their Creator. And this word Babel, we find it actually in verse 1. Do you know where it is? 
You know when we read Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem, the Hebrew says, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babel, we came to Jerusalem. Babylon is the green rendering of Babel, but the Hebrew scriptures always render it Babel. And how I wish the translators would have left the name as it is. And so to remind the reader of the Tower of Babel where we find the beginning of the nation's rebellion against God. For the nation's rebellion is a major element of the prophecy of this book of Daniel. He's got to speak about the end of this rebellion. And the meaning of the word Shinar is unknown, by the way. But rabbis associated this word with a Hebrew word, which, has a, which sounds a similar way. Shininaru, which means shaken, like an earthquake, like a land never at rest. They also called it the land of the dead. We read in the Talmud, it says, why is it called Shinar? For all the dead of the flood were shaken out there. For the word shaken out there shares the same continents as Shinar. You know, those two words, then, Babel and Shinar, speak of another dimension of this war, the spiritual war. And we can further see the extent of the, at the end of verse 2, the extent of this war. Twice, Nebuchadnezzar mentioned the house of his gods. First, we read that he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his gods. And then he brought the articles into the treasure's house of his God. This is how the book of Daniel begins. With a sad turn of the history of the people of God. And what a trophy. What a trophy it must have been for the forces of evil. It seems that they have won the day. But, but, this is only two verses out of the book. For the rest of the chapter and of the book will literally reveal their utter weaknesses. And many times in an ironic way. And it will reveal that while they thought they had the upper hand, God was in complete control. This is the book of Daniel. One major theme in the book of Daniel is the sovereignty of God. While Daniel begins with seemingly a seeming failure, it is the book of the Bible which brings out this great truth, one that we need even today to grasp. See, for instance, with which irony the Spirit speaks of the mighty Nebuchadnezzar. I'll bring you to Jeremiah 43.10. He says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will send and bring Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. How is Nebuchadnezzar God's servant? He thought he won over him since he brought all these goodies to his gods. But little did he know that he was just a pawn, a puppet, a cat's paw, a cat's paw. You know, a cat's paw takes its origin from the story of a lion who wanted some chestnuts which were roasting in ashes of the fireplace, in a fireplace. So a cat was sleeping next to it. To avoid getting burned, the lion used the cat's paw to drag the chestnuts out of the ashes. The lion got his chestnuts, but the cat got burned, just like Nebuchadnezzar's are. And behind the, the seriousness of this book, there, there, is, there, there are many places where the spirit literally makes this king look like a weak man, a frail man. So this ruler was God's servant for whatever he did. It was because God allowed him to do it. God allowed him to get into Jerusalem. Let me bring you to another passage in Chapter 4, verse 17, the second part. Look what it, what, what it is. You know, it was the time when, when Daniel was brought in front of Nebuchadnezzar to tell him about a dream he had and its interpretation. And Daniel clearly tells him, there he says, that God changes the time and season. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. This was, by the way, very bold for Daniel to say so. But then after revealing the dream, he goes even further. Look at verse 17 of chapter 4, the second part. It says, The most high rules in the kingdom of man, and gives it to whomever he will, and sets up over it the basis of man. Daniel literally tells the king that if he's in power, it's because of the God of Israel. And he affirms, like Jeremiah, that he's just a pawn in this whole matter. And, you know what, I don't believe that Nebuchadnezzar understood what Daniel meant. Right? Or maybe he did not hear. 
Or maybe he was so taken by Daniel's ability to describe his dream that he forgot who he was. This is when you know that God is in control. And this is a subject that is found in every page, if you want, of this book. You know, the word the Most High or the Most High God is repeated 13 times in these 12 chapters. And the irony of it all, we're going to see that even Nebuchadnezzar somehow recognizes that is the sovereignty of God. Look at chapter 4, verse 3, what he says. How great are his signs, and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. I frankly don't, don't believe he, he understood the import of these words. At the end of the chapter, in verse 34, 434, he says, And I bless the Most High and praise and honor Him who lives forever, for His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and His kingdom is from generation to generation. But do you see the contrast between the two verses and what is happening in the rest of the book? How the Lord even makes His enemies confess that He is the King of Kings. Of Cyrus later on, in chapter 6, 26. The next kings, for we see two kings here, even three. In 6, 26, Cyrus says, I make a decree that every dominion of my kingdom must tremble and fear before the God of Israel. Powerful, isn't it? Many thought, that, by the way, that both Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus became believers. By the way, I highly doubt it. I highly doubt it. It's not enough, by the way, to recognize the sovereignty of God was must submit to God. Why didn't two king, these, these two kings did not pursue their faith in God? Nor made God the only God of their kingdom, like the king of Assyria with Jonah, if you remember. They could... Actually, they could not because they did not really believe. Like it is today, you know, many still say that God is great, the greatest, but their lives do not reflect this confession. And then is the sovereignty of God. By the way, how do we define the sovereignty of God in there? The sovereignty of God is His right and power to, of dominion over His creation. He made it. And this is for, for the best of humanity, for if God leaves it to itself, our history would have stopped a long time ago. The sovereignty of God tells us that the world is not being ruled by chance or by man, but ruled by God. Today even a sparrow cannot fall without his notice. Yeshua told us so. So he cares about us. Nothing can happen that, you know, to those actually, who believe in him, who truly believe in him. At the end, by the way, of the book of Daniel, you will feel, I believe, covered and protected for his attributes or the attributes of God will bring these things upon us. Now back to verse 1 and 2. There's one more thing in there which speaks of the way God writes history in his book. See how it begins. In the third year of the reign of Joachim, Many, many, by the way, have said that there's a mistake in Daniel. Right in the first verse, okay, there is a contradiction, they say. Let me show you the, the apparent contradiction. I say apparent because there are no contradictions in the scriptures. There are apparent ones. Which at the end, by the way, when you look into it, it will increase our understanding of the historical context, especially here. Compare Daniel 1.1 1, 1 to 2 Kings 23.36, which says Joachim was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 11 years in Jerusalem. So how could he have reigned 11 years when after the third year of his reign he was deposed, he was taken away? The book literally begins with such an apparent contradiction. But why? Why? Because at the end... One must approach any reading of the scriptures with faith. A faith which first says that there's no contradictions, that it is all inspired by God. Many read the scriptures as if its validity depends on their understanding of the word. Now how can we resolve this problem? First, the man Joachim was not supposed to be there. He was not supposed to be there at all. He was anointed king of Judah by Pharaoh of the time, Necho, because he was his pawn. Pharaoh even changed his name to Joachim, for his real name was Eliakim. 
this fact brings in the other world power in play in Daniel. There were two world powers at that time, Babylon and Egypt. And Israel was in between. However, despite the advice of Jeremiah, who told this king to, to side with Babylon, this king befriended the loser, Egypt at the time, and which they allowed him to reign for 11 years. But for God, these 11 years did not count. But why mention three years? Why three? This is so revealing. This is explained to us in 2 Kings 24. This is after that the Egyptian army was conquered by Babylon in this famous battle of Karshemish that Joachim served Nebuchadnezzar for three years. But then we read that he turned and rebelled against him. And Daniel brings us to the end of these three years when this king, as he says in Daniel 1.1, came to Jerusalem to besiege it. This is the Spirit's way of inspiring history. Only what is relevant is revealed. And it makes the reading of the Bible so much more interesting. God will often remove what is not necessary. Like in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. Three kings are missing. Why? Because they were not supposed to be there. So we need to read the scriptures from God's perspective. And he will reward us. He will reward us for this. And so what we learn from the first two verses is that this is much more than a simple invasion. There, there is a spiritual dimension to which the words Babel and Shinar brings us to consider. We consider the, the, the spirit of rebellion which, which our world is under. Also the mention of these gods at the end of verse 2 shows us that even the Babylonians saw their victories as the triumph of their God against the God of Israel. And this is another, there's an, another strong irony at the beginning, by the way, of verse 2. It says like this, it says, And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. You know the word gave is Natan. That's a gift. He gave him as a gift, right? This is what it means. It doesn't say that Babylon conquered Jerusalem. He, he did not. For God gave it actually to this man. And at the end, by the way, Babylon itself will be punished. But do you know where it will be punished? When it will be punished? It's coming. This is explained to us in Revelation 17 and 18. Where it says in 18.8, for, for this reason in one day her plague will come. Pestilence and mourning and famine. And she will be what? Burnt with fire the same as she did to Jerusalem. God has the final word always. But all these things do not diminish the suffering of the people of God at this time. And, and we ask one question, by the way. Why did God allow this calamity to fall on his people? Then, many, thousands died. At the time of, of the, the, the destruction of the second temple, over a million people died in 70 AD. And we know lately, six million people died. This is why we realize that this moment in history marks, by the way, a major point in the evolution of the Jewish nation. What we see in the first two verses. This moment in Daniel chapter 1 marks the beginning of the times of the Gentiles. A title given by Jesus himself in Luke 21, 24. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. This is the time period in the biblical calendar we're still living in and which will end by the second coming of Christ. How did it come about? Why with Daniel? And what does it mean? From the time of David, from the time that David conquered Jerusalem until Daniel, for 490 years, Israel had control over the Temple Mount, where the Temple was standing. From the time of Nebuchadnezzar until today and until the second coming, Israel never had full sovereignty over the Temple Mount. This again marked the times of the Gentiles. You know, when the Jews came back to the land of Israel with Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah, they were still under foreign domination. They were under the Medo Persian dominations. After this, they were under the Greek dominations. After this, when the Messiah came, Israel was under Roman dominations. Then, after the destruction of the temple, in an attempt to wipe out all memory of the Jews in this land, the Romans changed the name of Israel to Palestine. This is the root of the word. Afterwards, since the 7th century, Israel was under Muslim domination. 
then Jews were allowed to pray at the Welling Wall during various periods of his time in history. But when the city of Jerusalem was divided in 1948, access to the wall was again denied to the Jews. Between 1948 and 1967, the Jews had neither their synagogues nor the wall in Jerusalem. For the 50 synagogues they had in Jerusalem were completely destroyed. Today, although the government of the modern state of Israel is located in Jerusalem, and the old city is is now in the hands of the Jews, the Dome of the Rock, a Muslim mosque, still stands in the area where Solomon's Temple stands, because we are in the times of the Gentiles. And so, Daniel brings us to the beginning of this time, which also marks the beginning of the diaspora of the Jewish people. From this time on, the majority of of, of the Jews live outside of the nations. As Moses predicted, even before they entered the land. In Leviticus 26, 33 says, I will scatter you, God says, among the nations and draw out a sword after you. Your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. And here we can see the history of Israel for the last 2,500 years and still going on, but God also promised that he will gather them back. This we'll see also in the book of Daniel. So we have in this book a panorama of the world history and also of the history of Israel. And while there always was a time when judgment cannot be averted, this is something beautiful here, by the way. God in his mercy and grace Uh, being always afflicted in all his people's afflictions always devised ways to alleviate their suffering as he did all the time to the Jews of the time of the Babylonians he sent three powerful prophets Daniel, Ezekiel and Jeremiah three prophets who lived the judgment with the people and saw the horrors of the Babylonians but kept the faith and greatly encouraged the people by their behavior and by their prophecies. There were three invasions, the first in 605 BC. In this one, Daniel was part of the first. He was there walking with the people and with him God performed great miracles for the people. He brought Daniel right on the top of the invading government. Daniel became prime minister of Babylon, surely to make the treatment of the Israelites there more tolerable. See, the Lord will always prepare the way for his own. He will be there. He will set up people there to alleviate the suffering of his people. At the second invasion, eight years later, in 597 BC, Ezekiel was sent to walk with the captives of of Israel. They had with them a bold and fearless prophet who encouraged and prepared them for the destruction of the temple ten years later with a description of the temple in heaven and with a detailed description of the new temple in the messianic time to come. Enough to make their walk to Babylon worth it. And Israel, and in Israel, for those who stayed there, was another prophet who encouraged them, you know, and he reassured the people of the presence of God, even in dire trial, Jeremiah, who witnessed all three invasions, but stood as a pillar for the believers in Israel. And we know that Jeremiah went three times to Babylon. He was, and he was allowed back. Perhaps he also accompanied the Israelites during the three deportations and came back. You see, God always looked after his own. He was present all these times, even though sometimes we think he's not here. You know, this is a familiar blueprint, blueprint that is of our father, who is always looking for our welfare. A similar thing happened when Jacob and his family went, you know, when they went to Egypt, you know, to make things easy for them. God raised Joseph also to be prime minister of Egypt, right next to Pharaoh, so to make life easier for his people. Later, when the Jews were under Persian domination in 478 BC, there was an edict formulated which gave a date when all the Jews of the kingdom will be annihilated. But Esther was already in the highest position possible in the kingdom. She was the wife of the king. This thing Haman did not know. We can see this protection with with, with the first churches as well. You know, as it became difficult for the believers in Jerusalem because of constant persecution. 
God sent Paul to establish other congregation <clears throat> who helped their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem and which became a refuge for them when they had to immigrate out of Jerusalem or they were kicked out of the city. And we will see that in chapter 3 of Daniel, that as Daniel's three friends were thrown into the burning oven, you know who was there waiting for them? Yeshua was there. He was there. God is always present. He is always present. And considering each of these, these great prophets, you know, d- during the, the first diaspora, we're reminded of our Savior. Jeremiah, you know, was the son of of the high priest, Helkiah, and believed to have been the high priest of the time. You know, the Targum of Lamentation begins with the words, Jeremiah, the prophet and high priest. And so we have a high priest witnessing the destruction of the temple and walking with the people to, the, you know, to their country of captivity. Today our high priest is Yeshua who also walks with us everywhere we go to comfort and support us Jeremiah speaks of the Messiah office of priest Daniel he's from the tribe of Judah we'll see this next week or the week after Uh, and he brings out the sovereignty of God and speaks uh, of the small stone which shatters all the kingdoms of this world and becomes the last kingdom on earth the kingdom where the son of man as he's called the Messiah will be king of kings Daniel reminds us of the Messiah's office of king and Ezekiel you know he prophesies of the one future temple of the millennium and, and Of the one who we will see when we attain actually our eternal abode, heaven. Ezekiel is a prophet. And his words were those of a prophet of hope. He reminds us of the office of the Messiah's prophet. Jeremiah then brings to mind the Yeshua priestly's office. Daniel, his office of king. And Ezekiel, his office of prophet. You see, Jesus is there. He's all over the book. We're going to see him even at every verse. In in all these three prophets, we can see God always protects his own, just like we are in Yeshua. You probably remember this Jewish story about a rabbi who was forced by persecution to leave his homeland and to wander about a distant country. His only earthly possessions, other than the clothing he wore and a copy of the scriptures, were a lamp by which he studied and a donkey upon which he rode. Late one evening, after a long day's journey, he came upon a small village where he sought shelter for the night. The villagers, however, turned him away. The only shelter this weary rabbi was able to find was next to a wall which surrounded a well on the outskirts of the village. So trying to make the best of the situation, he lit his lamp and began to read from the scriptures. Soon a violent wind rose and repeatedly blew out the lamp. Unable to read in the darkness, he reclined against the wall and tried to go to sleep. His rest was soon disturbed, however, by a nearby roar of a lion. He looked over the wall, just in time to see the lions dragging the slaughtered donkey into the um, the underbush. And so the rabbi was overwhelmed with distress, grief, and a sense of self-pity. He tried praying to God, but his prayers were hindered by the many complaints and embitterment sentiments that he had. The next morning, upon awaking and coming from behind the shelter of the world, he beheld a shocking sight. On the streets of the village lay um, mutilated bodies of villagers slain by a vicious band of marauders who had descended from the hills during the night. It was only then that the rabbis began to understand and to put his losses in perspective. If the villagers had received him, he would have been killed. If the lion had not killed and dragged away his donkey, its presence may have given him away. If he had learned a valuable lesson, something great is that is gain from great loss. And besides which, if his lamp stayed lit, right, they would have known where he was. There's one thing, I want to read that verse that God said to Abraham, Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. These words are for us as well. He is always with us. This is a story of Daniel, if you want, in a short verse. With all of this, we did not get to know Daniel, the man yet. I will close by mentioning what great quality of his personality, one that, that stands out. 
we will see that Daniel especially stands as a man of uncompromising integrity. This is an especially timely topic for our days, because the spirit of, of compromise is flourishing around us. Some are watering down the word of God by introducing foreign things into the, our congregations, and slowly accepting what God abhors. Daniel does not only speak of the end times of Israel and of the nations, but also and directly of the prophecies of the end time of the church. For the spirit of compromise is always a sign, uh, an overture to apostasy. To the church of Laodicea, which is not a church at all, and which will represent the church of Babel, the church of the tribulation, the last one found in the tribulation. It's starting today. You know, I recently read... You know, an article which spoke about our ocean. You know, I, I was surprised to find out that to date we have explored only 5% of the ocean. Th that is surprising because so little is known about, you know, the ocean which covers 70% of the planet. You know, it drives the weather. It regulates the temperature. It was only in 2012 that one human reached the deepest point ever reached, 11 kilometers deep. His name was James Cameron, who arrived at the bottom to collect scientific data, but his summary was specially designed to support all the pressure. And you know, when he went there, he realized he was not alone. There, was, there were fish in there. You know, these fish cope with extreme pressure in an entirely different way. They did not need a submarine. They, they, they don't build thick skins. They remained free and were swimming around like there was nothing. They actually compensate for the outside pressure through equal and opposite pressure inside themselves. Believers today, likewise, don't have to be hard and thick skinned as long as they appropriate God's power within to equal the pressure outside. This you can do with the word of God. Daniel is one who lived under tremendous pressure from all sides. He was with them. He learned the way they think. He learned their religion. He ate with them. Actually, not always. Actually, he didn't eat with them. That's true. <laughs> but he was with them all the time. He didn't fall. He stood strong, and we're going to find out why. We said it's because the Word of God, and we're going to find out where in the Word of God he went in order to get all that he knows. Let's bow ahead in prayer. Again, Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your word. We're so grateful for these prophets, and especially Daniel, Lord. As we're beginning this book, Lord, we ask for wisdom, understanding, knowledge, you know, to be like him, because this world is not getting better. And so we need, we need your word, we need your spirit, Lord. And so may the Lord send us help and blessings from his sanctuary in heaven and grant us support from our high. And to the congregation, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So they shall put my name on the children of Israel and I will bless them. Amen. May the Lord bless you all. This is great. Don't forget, next week we're starting the, the fall feasts of Israel. Fall feast. This is great. You know why it's great? Because we're going to see Yeshua. Okay, the first second coming of Yeshua within this feast. And I'm excited for next week because this is the rapture. If we get there, by the way. <laughs> if you have any questions or comments, you can ask. We. Oui? Okay. Euh, J'ai une question par rapport à l'esplanade des mosquées. Est-ce que c'est construit sur l'endroit le, sur le, où le temple de Salomon a été construit C'est ce que tu as dit C'est le même endroit. On ne sait pas où exactement, je veux dire, la position du temple lui-même. <coughs> ok, la position peut-être <coughs> exactement sous le, la mosquée ou à côté, mais le temple était là. Donc le mur de lamentation, il date 
À côté aussi, alors. Le, le mur de la montation, c'est un mur extérieur du temple. Le, alors, on ne considère pas que c'est un mur qui appartenait au temple lui-même. Il y avait une prophétie de Jésus qui dit que toute pierre, une pierre ne restera pas sur une autre, d'accord Donc, le, le, le mur de la montation peut être une autre prophétie qui va dire que le, la destruction du temple n'est pas encore complète. Et donc, ils vont l'utiliser, ça va être complet euh, avant sa deuxième venue. Ouais. Merci. So the question that uh, Imelda asked actually about the emplacement of this um, um, mosque, mosque. Uh, so how can, can we understand, the, it's, is it in, in the area of uh, Solomon's temple, can we know where Solomon's temple, temple stood, so uh, we know approximately, uh, we don't know exactly the position, but it, it should be there in this, in this uh, place, Solomon's temple, and uh, now uh, the, the wall actually of lamentation there, the welling wall is uh, probably a little bit um, outside of that area because everything was destroyed in uh, 70 AD that was pertaining to the temple itself. Really? Yes, I'm going to tell you in English. Uh, I know what the rock in the Daniel is. It is a tensor of Riemann. And I develop it. Okay, you'll tell me more about it. Thank you. Donc Pierre a ouais. quelque chose à dire ah, par Pierre. rapport au rocher et il va parler à Jacques. <laughs> Quelqu'un d'autre Good. So I'm going to ask the music team to come forward. I encourage you to read the book of Daniel. Read and reread it. There's so many things. Uh, there are so many things in there. So um, we're going to uh, close our service with these two songs. Uh, if you want to stand up, um, as the first song says, I stand.